Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. Hope you're all having a great day so far. And if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Welcome to episode six of my third season. Today is Wednesday, June 9th, 2021. My name is Sanal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now I'm recording this episode before. I'm so excited. I'm ridiculously excited. I'm recording this episode before I get my second dose of the Moderna vaccine. And I cannot wait to finally join the club. Join the club of all of you that are already fully vaccinated. Yay! Then maybe I too can start flying around the country, the world, maybe take a beach vacation this summer. I'm staying hopeful. But I'm also one of those folks that loves my masks anyway. I've grown very accustomed to masking throughout this pandemic year. And I also have friends and family worldwide, most especially in Asia, where masking is a part of everyday life. So I'm all about it. I have no problem with it. I think masks are fashionable and fun. So if the CDC adopts this masking policy for us stateside, I I have no problem with it. So Anyways, let's dive into today's solo session. It's just me today, and it's going to be simply packed, chock full of relevant industry healthcare news and all my compliance tips. Now, I keep diving into those smirk audits, and I know we're so tired of them, but I promise just a couple more episodes, and I'm going to stop where I promised at 16 smirk audits. But today, we're going to dive into number 14. So, they're already hitting so many practices. So please be mindful and keep watching out for those smirk audit letters that come to you at your practices in the mail. This week, I get into transforaminal epidural injections. This episode also highlights the newsworthy OIG work plan. And don't forget, it's one of my favorite things, right? That OIG work plan for May 2021. And I round out today's episode with a profound note on journeys from the ancient Chinese philosopher and writer Lao Tzu. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. And I just wanted to give a worldwide shout out of my thanks and my gratitude. I've been digging a bit deeper into my podcast analytics and boy, oh boy, I am grateful. I cannot believe I'm being listened to. This podcast series is being listened to in over 29 countries, 29 countries worldwide. And Paint the Medical Picture podcast series happens to be on the top charts in the Philippines. So I'm beyond humbled grateful and thankful to the UK, the Philippines, France, Pakistan, Puerto Rico, Singapore, the UAE, Hong Kong, Germany, South Korea, India, Canada, Belgium, Iran, Sweden, South Africa, Norway, Denmark, Switzerland, and so many, many more. Thanks to all of you. As always, a friendly disclaimer, remember I'm bringing you the current industry healthcare news, my compliance tips and recommendations based on my over 10 years of experience in front office, back end, coding and billing for multi-specialty physicians, compliance and auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into newsworthy. I wanted to go over the seven new May 2021 updates made to the OIG work plan. The first update is titled Audit of the Effectiveness of HHS's Governance to Ensure Hospitals Implement Measures to Prevent, to Detect, and to Recover 
from cyber attacks. This is an audit from the Office of Audit Services. Now, in recent years, multiple hospitals have fallen prey to significant cyber attacks, including ransomware attacks during the COVID-19 pandemic, which have impacted hospital operations as well as patient care. Now, back in October 2020, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, the FBI, as well as HHS, issued a joint cybersecurity advisory regarding ransomware activity, which targeted healthcare and the public health sectors. This advisory stated that threat actors have continued to develop new functionalities and tools, which thereby increase the ease, the speed, and the profitability of ransomware attacks. So OIG will audit HHS's governance over its programs to determine whether HHS's Office of Civil Rights, the OCR, has actually performed periodic due diligence audits of hospitals to assess compliance with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA's security, privacy, and breach notification rules and regulations to determine whether these audits effectively assessed electronic patient health care information, or EPHI, protections. Now, in addition, the OIG will determine whether CMS's certification process for participation in the Medicare program requires hospitals participating in the Medicare program to implement minimum security safeguards to prevent and detect cyber attacks, ensure continuity of patient care, and protect patient data. The OIG will also conduct security assessments at 10 U.S. hospitals to determine whether they have adequately implemented HIPAA security requirements or effective cybersecurity measures to prevent, detect, and recover from cyber attacks. The final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, the second OIG work plan update for May 2021 is titled Medicare-Related Capital Costs Reported by New Hospitals. This is also an audit from the Office of Audit Services. Now, hospitals are paid through Medicare Part A for Medicare-related capital costs, such as depreciation, interest, rent, and property-related insurance and tax costs. Most hospitals receive payment for capital costs through the Medicare Inpatient Prospective Payment System, the IPPS, whereby a portion of their payment for each patient discharge is intended to cover capital costs. New hospitals, however, can be exempted from the IPPS and be paid on a cost basis for their first two years of operation. The OIG will determine whether new hospitals claimed Medicare-related capital costs in accordance with federal regulations. The final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, the third OIG work plan update for May 2021 is titled Audits of Medicare Payments for Spinal Pain Management Services. This analysis is again stemming from the Office of Audit Services. Medicare Part B covers various spinal pain management services, including facet joint injections, injections, facet joint denervation sessions, lumbar epidural injections, and trigger point injections. Medicare Part B also covers the sedation administered during these pain management services. The OIG will audit whether Medicare payments for spinal pain management services billed by physicians complied with federal requirements. This final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, the fourth OIG work plan update for May 2021 is titled Meeting the Challenges Presented by COVID-19 Nursing Homes. This review is from the Office of Evaluation and Inspections. Now, this nationwide three-part study will examine how the pandemic affected nursing homes. The first part, part one, will analyze the extent to which Medicare beneficiaries residing in nursing homes were diagnosed with COVID-19 and describe the characteristics of those who were at greater risk. Now, the second part, part two, will describe the characteristics of the nursing homes that were hardest hit by the pandemic which means those homes with the highest numbers of patients who had COVID-19. Now, the third part, part three, will describe the strategies that nursing homes used to mitigate the unprecedented challenges of COVID-19. These challenges include procuring critical supplies, testing residents and staff, 
isolating high numbers of contagious residents, caring for those afflicted residents, and protecting residents and staff on a scale never before experienced in the United States. This final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, the fifth OIG work plan update for May 2021 is titled Impact of Expanding the Hospital Transfer Payment Policy for Early Discharges to Post-Acute Care. This analysis will be conducted by the Office of Audit Services. Now, the OIG will determine how the hospital transfer policy for early discharges to post-acute care, or PAC, would financially affect Medicare and hospitals if it were expanded to include all Medicare Severity Diagnosis-Related Groups, or MSDRGs. The transfer payment policy for discharges from hospitals to PAC facilities, such as a skilled nursing facility, a SNF, applies to certain specified MSDRGs. Analysis of Medicare claims data demonstrates significant occurrences of early discharges from hospitals to PAC facilities for MSDRGs that are not currently subject to the PAC transfer payment policy. Medicare pays a full prospective payment system or PPS rate to hospitals for these types of early discharges. In contrast, Medicare pays hospitals a reduced payment for shorter lengths of stay for certain MSDRGs when beneficiaries are transferred to PAC settings. And you can find this citation in 42 CFR section 412.4F. Now, this proposed audit would provide CMS with a more updated analysis of the financial impact that an expanded hospital to PAC transfer payment policy, which means all of those MSDRGs, would have on Medicare and hospitals. The final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, the sixth OIG work plan update for May 2021 is titled Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on State Child Support Enforcement Programs. The Office of Evaluation and Inspections is in charge here. Now, nationally, child support programs are an important source of funds for families, as well as high unemployment resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, makes these services even more critical. Now, using a survey of state child support enforcement, or CSE agencies, interviews, and document reviews, the OIG will assess the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on state CSE operations. In addition, the OIG will evaluate the support and oversight of states by the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement, the OCSE. They will also identify strategies and promising approaches used by state CSE agencies in managing these critical services during a national emergency. The final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, the seventh and final OIG work plan update for May 2021 is titled Audit of CARES Act Provider Relief Funds Payments to Healthcare Providers that Applied for General Distribution under Phases 1, 2, and 3. The Office of Audit Services is in charge here. Now, the Provider Relief Fund, the PRF, is a $178 billion program which provides relief funds to hospitals and other healthcare providers for healthcare related expenses or lost revenue attributable to COVID-19, as well as to ensure that uninsured Americans can get testing and treatment for COVID-19. Now, for the general distribution of the PRF, HHS allocated funds in three phases. The first phase involved $50 billion for Medicare providers. $18 billion was issued during phase two for certain Medicare providers in the Medicaid and children's health insurance program providers, dental providers, and certain other providers, as well as assisted living facilities. And in phase three, $24 billion issued for certain behavioral health providers, as well as newly practicing providers and providers that received a payment under a previous phase, one or two. Now, providers applying for general distribution funds must meet certain requirements such as submitting revenue information and supporting documentation to the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, which uses this information to determine eligibility as well as payments. 
The OIG will perform a series of audits and fu- of, of funds related to the three phases of the general distribution to determine whether payments were, number one, correctly calculated for providers that applied for these payments, number two, if they were supported by appropriate and reasonable documentation, and three, if they were actually made to eligible providers. The final report is expected in fiscal year 2022. Now, in my opinion, I always have providers who need this critical information to review their coding and billing practices or their overarching compliance programs. And as you can see, there are a few hot ticket items that I'll keep my eyes on for sure, like improving cybersecurity in the hospital setting, right? What process improvements can be made from the very, very start so we can keep up at the same pace as these crazy cyber criminals and avoid or lessen the impact and severity of future cyber attacks? And I'm also a bit disappointed to see spinal pain management services here. We must do better. Let's remember to keep reviewing our LCDs and NCDs here, and medical necessity and frequency limitations are a must, right? I think these reports with findings are always most interesting and informative, and I look forward to analyzing them in the years ahead. It's also important for my listeners to pay attention to these monthly OIG work plan updates to see how they may impact you, your provider, or your health system. Remember, even in my third season, stay tuned for my most favorite monthly OIG work plan updates. They drop the second Wednesday of each month. And now it's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. Let's dive into my compliance tips here in part 14 of my smirk audits that are blasting in across the country. Remember, these are a part of the 16 new Unified Program Integrity Contractor, the UPIC audits, that are being conducted via the Supplemental Medical Review Contractor, the SMERC, at Neridian. Their function is to conduct nationwide medical reviews of Parts A, B, and DME providers and suppliers as directed by CMS. It's the responsibility of the SMERC to review medical records and related documentation to ensure that claims are processed in accordance with CMS guidelines. Now, I provided you with details for 13 SMERC audits in prior episodes that involves DME supplies in non-covered skilled nursing facilities or SNFs, spinal cord stimulators, outpatient hyperbaric oxygen therapy, diabetic testing strips, polysomnography, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, more SNFs, specimen validity, therapeutic shoes for diabetics, intravenous immune globulin, botulinum toxins, DRG for thyroid, parathyroid, and thyroglossal procedures, and TENS units that are current audits in the SMERC's spotlight. But let's dive into part 14 here of SMERC audits. Now, the 14th is titled 01-034, Transferaminal Epidural Injections, Notification of Medical Review. Now, Noridian SMERC is conducting post-payment review of claims for Medicare Part B of A outpatient claims and Part B outpatient claims only of transferaminal epidural injection claims billed on dates of service from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. Remember, these are the time parameters. This notification includes the reasons for the review, documentation that will be requested in the additional documentation request letter, the ADR, as well as resources that providers and suppliers may wish to consult with as they're submitting their claims. Now, let's go over some background on the why, right? Why on earth is this SMERC audit happening? So let's go over some background details. Back in 2018, the Comprehensive Error Rate Testing, the CERT, Medicare Fee-for-Service, the FFS, Improper Payment Report, noted a 29.1% error rate for this service category. Now expanded, the error rate also noted an 86.7% error on insufficient documentation, with a 13.3% error rate directly related to lack of medical necessity. Now, the previous SMERC contractor also reviewed these transferaminal epidural injection services 
and they found a claims error rate of 40%. So with these percentages being so high, of course, further review was recommended. So of course, the current SMERC at Meridian is reviewing, and these are the reasons. They're going to narrow it down in scope for us. Thank goodness. Now, the scope involves, of course, Noridian SMERC performing their data analysis and conducting medical record reviews. Noridian SMERC will complete their data analysis and review activities in accordance with applicable statutory, regulatory, and sub-regulatory guidance. They're going to be honing in on type of Bill 13X for outpatient hospital. The Part B of A claims were identified by the 13X type of bill, or the TOB, with dates of service from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th of 2019. Remember, again, those are our time parameters. Now, in this project, the claim sample will also consist of Part B professional services in addition to the Part B of A facility claims. The Part B claims will be identified by place of service in the physician location setting. They are also honing in for us on two CPT codes. The first is CPT code 64483, which is defined as injections, anesthetic agent, and or steroid transforaminal epidural with imaging guidance, which could be your fluoroscopy or your computed tomography, your CT, at the lumbar or sacral levels, single level. Now, the second CPT code under scrutiny is CPT code 64484, which is defined as injections, anesthetic agent and or steroid, transforaminal epidural with imaging guidance, fluoro or CT, lumbar or sacral, each additional level. Remember, this is an add-on code, right? So list it separately in addition to the code for the primary procedure. Now, of course, we're not done yet. There are documentation requirements as well that go along with this. I'm going to go over a list of nine specific, very specific documentation requirements that will be in your ADR letter. These are the items that you will have to furnish to support your claims that have already been paid, right? Now that you're under review in this post-payment SMERC audit. Now, the first documentation requirement is going to be those claim forms, right? either that UB04 or that CMS1500. Now, the second documentation requirement is going to involve the physician or non-physician practitioner order for the date of service. The third documentation requirement involves the initial pre-procedural evals, which should include the history and physical exams, the complete pain history, the diagnosis or diagnoses, prior imaging studies and findings, a treatment plan, and documentation of other treatment methods that were tried and failed. The fourth documentation requirement involves the procedure report or the clinical documentation to support the services billed, including all procedure details, the medication administration record, evidence of radiographic guidance, which means prior fluoro or CTs, as well as pre- and post-procedure evaluations. Now, the fifth documentation requirement involves the periodic re-evaluations, including a summarization of the patient's history and interventions, the patient's responses to the procedures, as well as clinical rationale for ongoing intervention or other pain management techniques. Now, the sixth documentation requirement involves the documentation to support indications and criteria as specified in the local coverage determinations, those LCDs or those coverage articles. The seventh documentation requirement involves any other documentation that supports medical necessity of the injection services. The eighth documentation requirement involves that Advanced Beneficiary Notice of Non-Coverage, the ABN, if that's applicable. And the ninth, final documentation requirement is for the documentation has to include, of course, all electronic and or handwritten physician or other clinician signatures, right? And if their signatures are simply illegible, you must be submitting signature logs or attestation statements as well. Wow. 
So I've seen these services go amiss for years, and I've advised practices to adhere to their LCDs. They really are detailed and must be reviewed for all clinical indications, coverage, frequency limitations, and medical necessity guidelines. The OIG has issued reports for transferaminal epidural injection services for what's going on 11 years now. We must do better. Remember, these post-payment audits are a sign, right? They're a signal that something may be amiss in your documentation, your coding, and billing. These nine requirements are a very good reminder that you should be making checklists and improving workflows and efficiencies at your practice to ensure all documentation is being captured, coding and billing are compliant for all applicable statutory and regulatory guidelines. So, a better, smarter approach is one that's proactive and starts by painting a clear, rich, and vibrant medical picture the first time so your certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from the Chinese philosopher, writer of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So very true, right? I think this is a remarkable reminder on where your journey starts with one step. And I agree wholeheartedly as we take time to reflect on our path, on our accomplishments, we realize what we had to start. We had to take that first step. We must all begin somewhere and then keep going bumps and all, forks in the road, everything. We will never know just how far we can soar if we never take that first step, if we don't take a chance on ourselves. No one can take that first step for us, that chance for us. So I always believe absolutely anything is possible with that first step. We have a lifetime ahead of us and the wisdom of others to retain and rejoice in. I am happy Lao Tzu's spark still burns brightly in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. Please go out and make this a great day, an incredible week for yourselves. Aim a little higher and do a little more and give back in any way you can in 2021. There's so much each one of us can do. And as always, I appreciate you diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please continue staying safe and healthy. Practice safety for one and all during our collective life in the time of coronavirus. Thank you for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.